a wonderful introduction. I couldn't have done better. Well, thanks for this great introduction. Uh, it's been an, a very great moving experience. Now, I'm afraid I'm the boring academic. Now, you've had some wonderful talks this morning, but um, so what's my background? Um, I'm what's called a pathologist, which means after you do medical training, you spend lots of years looking down a microscope. What you don't know, or you, most of you won't know, is that Bess, who organized this, this event, and myself, we trained in a city called Adelaide in South Australia. Now, South Australia is a big state in Australia, as you expect. <laughs> Apart from Adelaide, there's not much else. Oh. And, <laughs> yeah, not even kangaroos. And, and during my training, I spent three months in a small town in the outback called Kubapedi, which is responsible for mining about 80% of the world's opals. It's a rough place. It really is the Wild West. And it's a place where about 60% of the people are on the run from the law. Only about 3,000 people. <laughs> and when I went there, there was absolutely nothing to do. It's, there is only one form of entertainment. And this is going to show my age. It's a drive-in movie theatre, which probably half of you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. <laughs> but the drive-in is something which, when you go along for entertainment. Now, where else in the world would you see this sort of sign when you go to the drive-in? <laughs> Patrons, explosives are not to be brought into the theatre. I mean, it's, isn't it? You would not see that sign these days. Why am I talking about this? It's because Kubipedi is, because it's in the middle of the outback. During the day, in the summer, it got out to about 48, 50 degrees Celsius. So the only way which people have developed a resilience is actually they live underground. So they're, within all the mines, they basically have these things called the dugouts, where people live where it's only 22 degrees. So this is one form of how a community develops a form of resilience. What I'm going to talk about is <laughs> Hong Kong and the bad hair day. I think many of you have had a day when nothing has gone right. I want to talk to you about a time when Hong Kong just didn't have one bad hair day that lasted for about four months. Initially, it started in February, when there's reports across the border in China of a respiratory illness, no one took much notice. And then one, there were one or two cases in Hong Kong. Eh, still, no one took much notice. And then there was the outbreak. People panicked. People fled Hong Kong. The government didn't really know what to do. It tried quarantining people. So it cordoned off a big area of Hong Kong to stop people getting out. As people fled Hong Kong, initially, the businesses weren't that concerned. But then once the trade started suffering, then they started getting concerned. People didn't know what to treat it with. Some people were trying Chinese medicine. Some people were trying anything. As I said, there was panic. People wanted to know what was the agent. Initially, one agent was found. A few days later, another agent was found. And then after about well, around May, June, it all finished. But the population of Hong Kong was decimated. Remember that term, decimation, because I want to come back to that later. So I'm going to show you some pictures of what the hospitals were like and the area which was cordoned off. Hmm, that's strange. I'm showing you the hospital, I'm showing you the area. But what's the problem? It was 1894. This is when there was the outbreak of bubonic plague in Hong Kong. And that's the area called Taiping Shan where there was the greatest mortality. 
And that's the area which the government tried to quarantine off. It was called the Cordon Sanitaire. And that's the hospital. It was actually called the Kennedy Town Glassworks, where they put people. So why am I telling you this? I'm not just messing with you. It's to show you that there are actually a lot of similarities between what happened in 1894 and in 2003. Those of you who were around at the time were, will know there was a strange outbreak of a respiratory illness and then it came to Hong Kong. How was I involved? Well, we had, our group had a system where if there's any strange illnesses, respiratory illnesses, we had, we were investigating them to see what, whether or not there was going to be anything funny. Initially we thought, was it going to be another outbreak of the avian flu, the H5N1, but everything came back ne negative. And then we got this tissue sample from the infamous, the Guangdong professor, which everything came up negative, and then finally we were then able to isolate this agent, and this is the electron micrograph which is shown around the world, which shows that on the surface of the cell all these little black dots, and that's the SARS coronavirus. For me at that time, working on this, it was a challenging time because not only were we dealing with a very dangerous virus in which we didn't know what was uh, the mortality, but I had a young son and was only one month old and do you go back home and in possibly infecting your son? Do you just stay at the hospital? What do you do? It was a great deal of time when people were worrying. But how did Hong Kong adapt as a general population? Well, I just want to propose to you that this was how we developed resilience during what I call a bad hair outbreak. And these are the number of steps which the Hong Kong people took. Firstly, take care of yourself. Within the hospital authority, there was what's called the buddy system, where every person working in the front line has someone else to look after them, to make sure that they had no lapses in their personal protective equipment, to make sure they weren't getting too tired or exhausted. The second thing, don't you lose your relationships with others. There's lots of stories you hear about pe when people were in hospital. They're physically isolated, but what kept them going was having pictures of their relatives by their bedside, being able to have those phone calls with people. They couldn't have the physical contact, but they didn't lose their relationships with others. Not to lose self-esteem. There was a time when we were totally demoralized, when there was the Amoy Gardens outbreak, we thought. Because initially we thought, it's just respiratory illness, but then Amoy Gardens said, no, you've got to rethink it. And that was the time which almost broke the camel's back. You know, the number of admissions to the hospitals, everything seemed to collapse. But we still kept up, and people were still encouraging us. Fourthly, adapting. This is where Hong Kong really developed. I mean, where else would you get people who have designer face masks? <laughs> Only Hong Kong. And then finally, to look on the positive. Luckily, no one else has said it today. But when life gives you lemons, you've got two choices. You can squeeze a lemon juice into your eyes and cry. Or you can do like our kids do at school. You put in a copper coin, a metal rod, and you turn it into a battery. That's what you can do. <laughs> so what good came of it all? Well, interesting, after the 1894 outbreak, there was a commission of inquiry, and they found that the outbreak in Taiping Shan was due to the poor housing. How is this too close to one another? So in the end, from that developed the buildings ordinance. And from that, we now have the Hong Kong Town Planning Board. So, when you want to blame the developers, you can blame also the plague. Not much else happened. But what happened after SARS? Well, we had the team clean. If you look around, you see now people are having the antibacterial, the alcohol wash. In the lifts, you can always have the hand sanitizers. Hong Kong has really adapted. We've changed for the better. 
And this is where, live as if you were living for the second time, as though you had acted wrongly the first time. So the, I think it's an important quotation in which I want to emphasize is that how did Hong Kong adapt for the second time? Because we had that second time. Since 1997, we've had the numerous outbreaks of uh, influenza. And this is the electron micrograph showing these influenza virus particles which I've taken. And in 2009, we had the swine flu outbreak. How did Hong Kong react? You might remember we quarantined some tourists in a hotel. Same thing. But what was the reaction? It was almost like a carnival. People were smiling, they were giving gifts. People, it was actually, there was no panicking. We, didn't, we couldn't have contained the virus. This is the uh, slide from the WHO, which shows that the virus spread all over the world. But Hong Kong had actually developed quite nicely. Helen Branswell wrote a very nice, interesting article. It's now been 10 years since SARS, about how resilient. And she says, an incredible saga, SARS ended lives and decimated some other families. That word decimation is a Roman word where in Roman times, if they were deserters or people in cowardice, they'd line them up and every tenth person would be killed. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you're gone. The mortality of SARS was decimation. 10% of people who got SARS died. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. What do we have now? In the past few weeks and months, we've had the new coronavirus. And now we've got the H7N9 across the border. The Romans didn't have a word for when 30% of the people are going to be died, who are going to be dead after getting the virus. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. I can't predict how this is going to turn out. But one thing I think is sure is that Hong Kong will adapt, and I think Hong Kong has developed its resilience. Thank you. <laughs>